great. Uh, please pardon all the coughing and sniffling, but hopefully we'll get through the webinar fine. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know this is a post-holiday webinar, so still glad to see so many people here. Um, so welcome to Atma webinars. I'm Vechali and I'm a senior consultant at Atma. Uh, Atma, as you know, is an accelerator that supports NGOs to become bigger, better, stronger by capacity building and creating systems and processes uh, that help solve organizational development issues. Uh, we started our journey in 2007 and since have supported many organizations in this journey of excellence and we're very grateful for that. Uh, the Atma webinar um, is a curated platform that started in 2017 where speakers share their practical experiences that could benefit other NGOs. Uh, the topics are wide ranging from human resource management to program management, finance policies, and any other pressing topics that affect all of us, all of us in the sector as a whole. So you can find all our previous webinars on our YouTube channel uh, and you'll get that in your mails. I'm sure you've been getting that. Um, so coming to today's topic, right? Um, we know that voluntary work and volunteers have been at the core of the entire nonprofit sector, if I can say that. Um, I've often seen people slightly confused when they realize that many of us get paid to do this work, right? Um, and as our sector professionalizes more and we've become more systematic uh, and intentional with our work, right? engagement with volunteers has also adapted. Um, in the survey that we rolled out to everyone uh, for this webinar, um, about 80% of you said that you do work with volunteers and about 5 to 10% also work completely with volunteers uh, on a completely voluntary model. Uh, but at the same time, only 20% have like an excellent experience with volunteers. So today we want to discuss uh, the challenges that come with volunteering and also um, what kind of solutions and strategies we can use to leverage uh, volunteers and their passion uh, for our cause, right? Um, and we have a fantastic panel today for that. And thank you so much uh, for joining. Uh, I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, each one. Um, sorry. So first we have Oishik from Evolve. Uh, with a background in economics, uh, Oishik Saha transitioned to the development sector through Teach for India Fellowship. Later, he joined uh, TFI staff leading social innovation and managing projects such as Innovate Ed and Be the Change. Uh, Oishik then moved to India Welfare Trust, creating Evolve, a volunteering incubator, and overseeing IWT's incubation and new initiatives. And now, again, to his venture, uh, Avagam, uh, he actively supports incubators, entrepreneurs, and philanthropists. Uh, so welcome, Oishik, and thank you so much for joining. We will be understanding more about Evolve uh, once we start the discussions. And next, I want to introduce uh, Vibha, who's from Outlaw India. Um, just a second. So Vibha is a 2023 uh, graduate of the National Law School of India University. She founded Outlawed India in her second year at law school to bridge the accessibility concerns around law and justice. She has previously been affiliated with organizations like Reap, Reap Benefit, Agami, Land Conflict Watch, and is an NQBT at The Circle. Um, she's also going to be talking more about her organization, but Outlawed India is, a, um, is creating a platform of paralegals to provide legal aid to low-income and vulnerable communities. Um, and we'll hear more uh, later. And finally, we have Prem. Um, just a second. Welcome, Prem. Uh, Prem is a dedicated social worker from Delhi so School of Social Work, and he combines his knowledge of profession and power of passion to drive meaningful social change. He sees every issue through the lens of human rights and basic human dignity. Uh, as a result, he founded a platform where people from all walks of life, whose voices often go unheard, can express their concerns, not as a matter of charity, but as a matter of right, uh, which is also such an important shift that we've seen over the years in our sector. Uh, and Sampak Sati is a case-solving platform that works with volunteers to improve the lives of those in need in underserved communities by giving them access to prompt support. Uh, and we'll learn more uh, soon. Um, so I'm going to start uh, our, our webinar uh, which is going to be like a fireside chat. Um, and we'll start with uh, just understanding what each of them do 
so that we're able to understand what their volunteering experiences are. Uh, and before we start, just a request to all the audience members, we do want to keep this as interactive as possible. Uh, feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat box throughout the webinar. Um, when appropriate, I will keep bringing them in. Um, and if they're un unanswered, then we'll take them up at the end. Okay, We do have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for uh, a Q&A, but uh, it's always better I found to address them right then and there. So if you have any question or if you have anything to add, feel free to use the chat box. And if there's something really pressing and uh, something that you think will be great to uh, everyone for, to hear, do raise your hand and uh, unmute and speak. Awesome. So is everyone ready? Shall we begin? Awesome. Great. So we're going to start with you, Arshik. Um, And given the long volunteering history at India Welfare Trust, right? If some of you don't know, we'll uh, link the website in the chat. Uh, what are some innovative ways in which you've seen uh, nonprofits that have been able to tap into unique skills and talents of volunteers? And it'll also be great to hear more about uh, the work that you've done. I'm going to share the screen as well. So just a minute. Cool. Um, so uh, before Vaishali I jump into the second question, the first question about what uh, uh, what are the creative ways volunteering can happen? Uh, can I just run through what we do a little bit and uh, like uh, why volunteering? Absolutely, absolutely. Please. Cool. So, um, hi folks. My name is Vishak, as Vaishali mentioned, and. Um, I've been in the volunteering space for a while now. It's been two years, so not very long, but uh, I'm working with India Welfare Trust and um, we are trying to see how we can get more early stage entrepreneurs um, like Vibha and Prem into the volunteering space because we see that there is a lot of scope in the work that volunteering can offer. And this is something that we have seen over a period of decades as well, right? Most movements are voluntary in nature. Um, so, uh, Vaishali, the next slide, please. Um, so th this is this incubator that uh, I work on. This is called Evolve. Uh, and it's the only volunteering incubator in India. Right. So far, along with Vibha and Prem, there are 12 other entrepreneurs who have been uh, incubated and are being incubated by Evolve. And the core of these solutions, we are not focused on any specific theme, but the core of the solution is that they are scaling up their work through the volunteering model. Right. So you will find so you can go through the website, but you will find solutions um, around education, uh, mental health, you will uh, civic cases like Prem's doing. And then uh, Prem and Viva will talk a, more about their work as well uh, from recycling, ups, like, upcycling, etc. So all all sort of um, kind of themes that they are working in. The vision for us is to get every Indian vo to volunteer for one hour a week and 52 hours a year. Um, so we also do different kinds of work at India Welfare Trust. So we work with um, uh, larger corporates. We work with larger NGOs as well. But uh, at Evolve, we, our focus is working with early stage entrepreneurs and can, how can we get them ready? Uh, how, what do we measure? Simply volunteering hours, volunteering numbers, the kind of retention that these volunteers have and the quality of experience that these volunteers have, right? Um, so uh, all, all the entrepreneurs who we work with, they are focused uh, more on these kind of metrics that we choose because we are looking for scalable sort of solutions which can scale volunteering. Um, very quickly, I'll just run you through why volunteering and uh, like why not volunteering as well. Vaishali, if you go to the next slide once. Um, if you want, you can pause me here and if you want to ask something. Can I go ahead? Okay, I I'll taking that as a yes. But um, so I just wanted to touch upon uh, why volunteering a little bit. Um, so uh, so I think it's important for people to really take action. And the ultimate goal is behavior change, right? Um, so getting people to do stuff, solve local challenges is, I think, something that really works well and is something that we are also trying to do. Um, getting volunteers to take ownership of functions of the organization, right? Not just functions, but also programs, verticals, etc. Um, that really helps a lot of organizations um, do a lot more work with spending sort of less bandwidth um, from, from their own side. However, I'll talk about why not volunteering as well. 
and Vibha Prem can maybe agree disagree on that. Uh, but I think it's important for volunteers to also take ownership of the organization, the functions of the org. Uh, volunteering helps create advocates for your work as well. And we have seen that with a lot of these um, larger organizations uh, like Make a Difference, like Robin Hood Army, uh, like a Team Everest. So you will see that most of their work is through uh, the promotion that they're doing, the even the fundraising that they're doing, right, are through volunteers. So you can create really advocates of your work who are also owners of the work that they do, work that you're doing. Uh, it helps reduce costs. So definitely, I think if you can get volunteers to pick up a lot of your functions and uh, and, and and it really helps reduce the kind of costs that you incur otherwise. And it also helps in sustainability. So I'll talk more about it. But I think you can also use volunteers to raise funds. But again, that's eventual. I think the goal of volunteering should not be just raising funds. But um, first, the goal should be to create high quality value and then eventually think about uh, sustainability. Uh, next slide. Very quickly, I'll move on. Uh, I think it's important to also not consider volunteering. I just wanted to share that because a lot of time people are very upset about uh, like volunteering or volunteering is something that I'm spending a lot of time on, but it's not giving back enough that I want to. So I think volunteering definitely needs significant time and energy and money as well, right? From the founder side, from the team member side. So definitely think about if you really have the bandwidth to do so, else don't even think about volunteering. Um, and, and you can think about it in a small scale. And there are friends and family helping you. But like volunteering as a program, I think you shouldn't think about if you can't spend enough bandwidth on it, right? Uh, it should be someone's full-time job, right? Think about if you can hire someone or give as a founder at least 80-90% of your time uh, on volunteering, right? Uh, if it's too costly, don't do it. It's, be it's better to hire, right? For example, there's this organization we support called Santushta. Uh, the cost of, so they work in Jaipur and they teach in Anganwadi's uh, through volunteers, right? The cost of getting a teacher to deliver the same content would have been around, let's say, ballpark 450, 500 rupees per hour, right? And the, and the cost that they are being able to deliver the volunteering model um, through trained volunteers also, right? They are training the volunteers to deliver the models. It's almost like 40, 50 rupees. 10x less of what they would have incurred otherwise, right? Uh, so I think those kind of unit calculations is important to be done. If you feel that it's better done with a, I would rather hire someone to do the same work. I, I would say that's something that you should focus on and not, uh, you don't want to get volunteers who you have to incur 450 bucks per hour on, then you would rather get someone who is a professional teacher do the same job, right? That's my larger point. Uh, last slide. Um, I think a lot of these questions will come again as well, but I think just meaningful experience for volunteers. Um, Vibha Prem can talk more about it. Uh, think about the roles that you want to run, right? Running programs, technical skills, are there key functions, fundraising, what even in a program, what are some things that you want to run, right? Um, uh, students, there are different types of volunteer students, homemakers, retired folks, working professionals. Students are the most common ones, but the other demographics, I would say, are still very untapped. People are getting a little more into working professionals, but homemakers, retired folks, there is a big demographic which is still largely untapped. There are a lot of organizations started pitching to corporates to engage employees. Um, so you can do that as well. And organizations like Gudera, etc. are also doing that kind of work right now, which facilitated corporates and employees. And then I think where to start, you can just start with a pilot and see uh, what you can do. Uh, that's where all of our entrepreneurs also started. Um, yeah, that's broadly it. But yeah, Vaishali, now I can take your questions. Sorry, if I took too much time. No, 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 that was important. And I think you covered many things uh, in your intro. Um, I would also like, uh, you know, if the audience wants to know more about uh, uh, more about Evolve, or we can also hear from uh, Vibha and Prem, because my question is uh, to both of you next. And uh, of course, like, as we go, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, you know, the challenges that come also, uh, as Ojik rightly pointed out, right? Uh, that sometimes it's too much investment. Um, and we've see, we see that with uh, many people in their responses. Um, so, uh, Vibha and Prem, would you also like to uh, explain your work 
and also uh, how you use volunteers in your organization, right? And then Aishik will come back to you with another question. Um, I can go first if that's okay, Prem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, Vaishali, would you mind going to the next slide, please? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the director of a not-for-profit company called Outlawed India. Where we're, what we're working towards is enabling last-mile justice delivery. Um, I think there's quite a lot of conversation around making law and justice accessible, but that usually tends to be a very top-down approach where on the field with communities who actually need legal aid, legal information, um, that trickle-down effect is not happening. And that's sort of what we're trying to solve for. And our broad idea is, can we create intermediaries who can help people understand the law, but also navigate it when they actually have legal concerns? Um, and that's broadly the type of work that we do. Um, we work with different categories of volunteers. So let me start off um, explaining exactly what we do. Right now, we're working with law schools across the country where we're training law students um, who we thought was a great demographic because we're working with the law, of course, where we're training them to work with their communities to strengthen grassroots engagement with the law. We're running what's called an active citizen challenge. We've realized through our experience of working with quite a few people and quite a few volunteers that if you just tell volunteers key you know what, we need to improve legal awareness. Um, it's up to you to decide what you want to do about it. That often does not really lead to tangible actions. So we needed to create a program that had structure to it, but still some level of flexibility to allow volunteers to do what they want to do. So our active citizen challenge is a list of, it's a task list of 10 activities that college students around um, India can take part in. So these activities, I'll give you examples range from conducting legal awareness workshops to doing door-to-door -door campaigns on um, laws relevant to that specific community. For example, um, the photo that you see at the first photo um, in the slide here was a door-to-door -door campaign that was conducted um, in the outskirts of Hyderabad by our volunteers at Nalsar University, where they were helping small business owners and others understand about um, cyber laws specifically, which was a big part um, of, I think, issues that people face, for example, phishing, things like that are issues that people face on a day-to-day -day basis. The second and third photos are our volunteers who are conducting legal awareness workshops um, in government schools, in other universities. Um, so the goal of our volunteers and the way that we engage them is to get them to work with the communities directly, um, which means that we don't want them to just be in their own universities because typically, and I just graduated from law school a few months ago, we tend to be in a bit of a bubble. Um, this also helps, I think, curate a certain level of responsibility among law students themselves, knowing that they need to be flag bearers of the law um, and take forward the cause of legal awareness um, and legal aid as well. We also work with other categories of individuals. For example, we work with adult populations um, to understand legal aid issues in communities. We're also training paralegals right now from low-income communities who can serve as First point of contact, legal aid. Oftentimes, people assume that when you have a legal issue, um, you automatically need to go to a lawyer. That's not necessarily true. Um, apart from access issues relating to lawyers, oftentimes issues that communities have, like needing support to get an FIR registered or um, helping understand sort of the status of their case in court if they already have something ongoing. These are not things that typically lawyers would do which means that you need someone from your community who understands your context to actually step in um, and provide you assistance with that. So our volunteers broadly work in two categories. First is stronger legal awareness and skill building among communities, which happens through actions like these legal awareness workshops, through door-to-door -door campaigns, um, helping communities do things like file RTI applications. And then of course, we have the more direct route of helping communities with legal aid which means helping them with things like getting an FIR registered or um, helping file for a social welfare scheme, or if you need a protection order, these are things that paralegals potentially could help you with. Um, this is how we engage our volunteers. I think a large part of our volunteers do come from law schools. It's something that we're trying to diversify right now. We do have community leaders um, coming in. Um, we're also looking to work with schools where we have a similar model of an active citizen club um, with actions that school students can take as well. And this is roughly how we work with volunteers. Uh, this is a niche, as in they're doing a very specific kind of task. 
which means that oftentimes it does involve a certain level of training that needs to come from our end as an organization and that's something that we committed ourselves to so in terms of oishik talking about the costs that's something that you need to think about um so this is what we do with working with our volunteers i'd be happy to answer any questions but i'd love to pass it over to prem um to learn a little bit about more about his work as well thanks subha um that's some great work that you're doing and i would uh, honestly look forward to collaborating uh so uh coming to the work that we do uh, could you vishali uh, could you please move to the next slide uh the next slide yeah thank you so uh, as you can all see uh, that oh sorry uh, so this is prem uh, i'm one of the co-founders at sampark sathi foundation and uh, this is as you can see on the screen uh, so we what we do is we have problems on one hand uh, from the underserved communities on the other hand we have solution providers basically ngos or government institutions which can solve their problem these problem people who have problem they raise a concern with us across any thematic area be it health education human rights skill and livelihood or government welfare schemes so people living in the slum areas have multiple problems but they do not know who to reach out to when they are in need so we have created a, a network of community volunteers on the ground and these community volunteers are basically asha workers anganwadis local youth of the community they can be local ngos also and they can be local pradhan also so all of them reach out to us with the problems of uh, the people in their community and once they reach out to us we connect them to ngos that can solve their problem for example someone in the slum area wants to get an eye cataract operation done and they don't have money to pay for it in this case what we do is we take them to our ngo partner who can solve this problem and as you can see to fill this gap of awareness and accessibility we have volunteers these volunteers take up each case let's say this volunteer will take the case of an eye cataract operation they will stay with the beneficiary they will help them with the documentation part and they will take them to our ngo partner guide them through the route and stay with them throughout till the case is completed often what happens is people uh, from these underserved communities they often face exploitation wherever they go even if they go to any government institution even if they want to get some pension done or they want to go to a hospital they will face exploitation at the hands of authorities at the hands of guards but if you send a volunteer with them our volunteers are basically called sathis i'll come to that why we call why we use the term sathi here uh, it's very crucial so uh, volunteers they assist them they stay with them and when the volunteer stays with them these people feel empowered they don't feel they don't uh, get exploited at the hands of authorities be it school hospital or any government institution so it also helps them from saving them from exploitation as well as we also help them get uh the services accessible to them accessibility is a crucial point here so uh why we call them sathis is uh because uh sathi basically in our at our organization is a friend sathi is a friend and we all understand what a friend does friend helps a, a friend is always there for you whenever there's a need right so that's why uh can you please move on to the other uh, next slide yeah as you can see here there these are all sathis with their beneficiaries in in both the pictures so at sampark sathi uh, we also uh, we believe that uh, only through collaboration uh, among ngos and through volunteering can the scale happen and can we truly make an impact these volunteers uh, so i must mention that we have two types of volunteers uh, they are case solvers and they are case bringers these case bringers are basically people from the underserved community as as i mentioned asha workers anganwadis these case solvers who stay with the beneficiary throughout the journey are basically college students who are looking to volunteer who are looking to do their bit in the society of course there there could be uh, they they could be volunteering for certificate or some other uh, purposes but at sampark sathi we make sure that 
if they are solving one case or two cases or three cases, they put their heart and soul into it. Only then um, they they volunteer. So yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, open to question and answers if you have any about the work that we do and how we are actually engaging volunteers, our volunteer pipeline. So yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Viva and Prem. And uh, I, I think it really helps us understand um, all the work that you're doing with volunteers. And it's a, it, from what I understand, there is a lot of work that the volunteers carry through, right, for both your programs. Um, and this is a question uh, that maybe all of you can answer. Um, one is that what kind of trends are you seeing when you're recruiting volunteers, right? And uh, how easy or difficult has it been to get volunteers? If uh, if we can touch upon that, yes, Aishik, would you like to start here? No, please, Viva Prem, go ahead. Yeah, please. Space is... sure. Do you want to take the... I, I'll take uh, so uh, initially we were facing a lot of problems. Uh, initially uh, we were going by the word of mouth through existing volunteers. At Evolve also we learned that uh, it's difficult to get the first volunteer. Once you get the first volunteer and you build credibility and you build um, a sort of repo with the volunteer, the rest comes in place. So uh, once you get your first volunteer, the word of mouth plays a lot of role in building that credibility. So initially we were walking through word of mouth, but over time we realized and all through our learnings through Evolve, we realized we need to build a hierarchical structure also in place where we can have volunteer leaders, where we had campus ambassadors. So it was not just um, one way through which we were getting volunteers. There were, we need to, uh, we needed to create multiple um, chains through which we can um, get in volunteers. So now we are working with volunteer leaders. And in turn, these volunteer leaders do is the volunteer leaders recruit around 20, 30 volunteers under them. They um, brief them about what the organization does. They brief them about their roles and responsibilities. And uh, they take their feedback. They stay with the volunteers. The volunteer leader goes with the, into the field with the volunteers, tells them how to complete this case. So earlier, there was only volunteer manager and the volunteers. But now we have volunteer manager and volunteer leaders, and then we have volunteers. So this chain, this delegation of tasks has also helped us scale in terms of volunteering very well currently. It's And it's working pretty well for us. So yeah, I, not just a volunteer leader, but we also have um, I volunteer. We are also registered in I volunteer. We need to have multiple platforms where we can yeah. get volunteers, right? Not just uh, one cycle. We cannot depend on one cycle, no. So yeah, we need to have multiple platforms. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I mean, like, so I mean, systems and processes do help, right? So uh, yeah. that's really good Definitely. to hear that hierarchy uh, or making some structures, making some structures. differences between, um, because also people come with different levels of time, availability, bandwidth, and commitment, right? So I think that's a great way to get that in. Uh, Vibha, would you also like to share? Uh, because like you mentioned, your work is very niche. So you can't actually work with everyone, right? But I'm sure many people would want to. So how do you manage that? I think the goal is to be able to work with everyone, which is also sort of what we're working towards with um, Evolve. But it is true that a large segment of our volunteers do come from one very specific background, which is law students. Um, these are students who are in, and most of the volunteers who do come, we've noticed that they are on the younger side. Like for example, the first to third year law students tend to volunteer with us a lot more. Um, I think our pipeline looks a little bit different. Um, the first thing is that because we have a very specific audience of law students, what we've been able to cultivate is a sort of network of law students and a network of law schools. So I think, look, I don't think there's anything wrong if you have a specific demography of volunteers you want to work with. It's, it's actually fantastic. But what you need to be able to do is really commit to that demography, which is what we've been trying to do. So we work with law schools across the country. That's one pipeline that we get through. This may mean that we work with the college as a partner or we work directly with the students. Um, that level of flexibility is really important because for some, sometimes getting those permissions through colleges may be very time consuming, resource consuming, but working with students directly may actually just make more sense. Um, so the goal for us is to be able to work with every law school in the country. 
Um, so that's sort of what we're building towards. So our first major pipeline, of course, is the law schools themselves. We follow really simple on like recruitment mechanisms where we have sort of details of the program itself. And just a Google form that goes out, we have interviews that happen and they join us. I'm completely with them on having these sort of categories of volunteers, like having a volunteer head, um, a volunteer leader, things like that. That's something we do and it works really well for us. I think it also helps with retention a lot more. Uh, where volunteer leaders typically in our experience tend to stay on for longer periods of time because of the level of responsibility that they have. So that's the first pipeline. The second pipeline, I think, is building um, sort of partnerships for yourself. For example, right now, um, one of our really um, supportive partners is this platform called Loctopus, which is a platform that exclusively posts um, material and opportunities for law students or people in the legal sector more generally. Um, and that partnership was really important for us. So right now we're able to get hundreds of volunteers um, because our posts sort of go up on that platform and law students are looking for that work experience, um, which get, gets me to the point that I think Aishik and I have been talking a lot about, which is motivation, which is a big part of the recruitment process. If you aren't, at least for us, at the recruitment level, able to nail why a volunteer should join you it's it's sort of harder to actually get volunteers um on board with you um so for us one of the ways that we have i think understood this is uh, look law schools in india are very skewed typically um in that a lot of opportunities tend to go to these um quote unquote top ranked universities and there isn't too much of a trickle down that happens to say state universities or sort of um lower income private universities as well and for us, that's also something we want to solve for, which is creating meaningful work experiences in these tier two, tier three universities as well. So we try to target those as much as possible too. I think the third system of volunteering is through partnerships with other NGOs, which has worked really, really well for us. Um, for example, when we work with communities, the way that we're building our own communities is through exploring the communities of other NGOs. Uh, for example, we're working with two um, NGOs right now called Gubbachi and Swatantra, both, both based in Bangalore, uh, where we're uh, working with them to work with paralegals and then onboarding volunteers through their community because they've now become interested and invested in the work that we are doing. Um, so I think working with other NGOs um, where you can add value to their community is something that's been really, really game-changing for us, I feel. Um, I've got two questions. I'm just going to answer those um, mm -hmm. right before I hand over to Aishik, if that's okay. How do we directly reach out to students? This is a great bit because we just graduated and we're barely done being students. We have sort of contacts with law students across the country. This is also something we built through Loctopus, for example, um, because Loctopus is such a large platform that has law students across the country. We're able to reach out to students more directly. Um, but of course, even building your own network is super important. So, um, you know, talking to friends, asking them, do you have, you know, um, someone studying in this law school or this law school? A lot of that when we started off, that is how it started. It isn't that suddenly we have a network of 500 law students across the country. Um, it takes the first five that grows to a 10 that grows to like a 20. Um, so just being patient with reaching out directly is, is very important. Um, and once you've reached out directly to a group of students, it means you have those networks that now exist, right? Um, so once we've been able to reach out to say students in 10 universities, we have those contacts. So that makes that sustainability a lot easier for us. Um, second on what motivations we offer volunteers, a few different things. Um, some of our partners actually offer some incentives directly to volunteers. For example, a partner um, said that they would give discounts on online courses relating to the law for people who are volunteering with us, which was a really interesting incentive. And a lot of volunteers actually did end up taking that up, which was great. Apart from that, we do, of course, issue certificates. Um, we've understood, I think, motivation level-wise, a large section of our volunteers come in looking for real work experience. So consistently, I, in fact, I did a recent set of calls with volunteers, and consistently what we've been hearing is they like that they're being given real work. So the fact that they're able to go into communities, get permission to go to a high court, get permission to go to a government school and do this all by themselves is in and of itself a huge motivation. So a big part of our program design goes into thinking 
what are the actions we can curate for law students, which gives them that feeling that they are doing real work, that what they're learning in law school is going into some tangible work. And of course, we do things like social media recognition, um, all of that as well. So those, the standard things around like certificates, doing social media recognition, um, all of that we certainly do. But I think I, for us, our identification of big motivations has certainly been the level of work that they're able to do. Um, and the second motivation is that they're also able to get some level of guidance and mentorship, which was the second highest rated um, sort of motivating factor, I think, from some of my conversations. Um, we have sort of mentors who can either be senior volunteers who've been with us for a very long time or the core members from the Outward India team itself who are able to guide them through some of these things, um, which works as a reasonably good motivation as well. Um, when you're a law student, and I think this is something that we understood from our lived experience, you're constantly looking for work experience. Um, and sometimes there is a dearth of that. Uh, I think what we're able to offer is quality work experience that allows volunteers to hone in some of those skills. Um, and I think making sure the volunteers know that when they're signing up for it has certainly been a big advantage for us. But yeah, I've been talking for quite some time. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Aishik. But those are some really important points. And there's also like one small question that was there uh, about uh, minimum time frame. Right? Um, how yeah. how long uh, yeah. do you have any minimum time frame? Both yeah. Frame and <laughs> yeah, it's like that person read my mind because I was literally talking to Arshik about this last week about whether we should create like a time frame for a commitment. Um, I'll tell you my experience. I think it's it's been slightly different because we do actually have a time frame for volunteers. Um, they, when they sign up, they typically sign up to work with us for three months, unless it's an independent project. Um, we think that that is the amount of time they need to structure their programs because they're not just doing one thing. They're doing multiple things. They're engaging community, which means that we also need to be able to train these volunteers to do that. Um, so it does require a certain amount of time. To do. Um, I think Aishik can maybe talk about this a little bit because he told me something that changed my mind about this a little bit, which is understanding the joy of volunteering before you commit to a specific time frame. But I'll hand it over to you, Aishik, because I think you can have to do it. Sure. So, uh, I mean, one thing that, I think is important in this day and age of uh, instant gratification, right? Like everyone's looking for something quick. Um, so I think one thing that works well is that can you give them a taste of what they will do, which I think works very well in case of Sampark Sati because they're actually going and solving a case, right? So you sort of see the joy in the life and in the face of the beneficiary. Uh, whereas for Vibha, I think that might be a longer period unless there is an RTI being filed or something like that, right? Like the... If you're doing, for example, an awareness session, you can't really, uh, I mean, maybe you can actually see the change there as well. But like my larger point is that try to uh, design something which is quick and something that can really create value for the volunteer and then let them choose if they want to continue for longer or not. Um, so I think that's just my take um, aligned with what Vibha was sharing. In terms of the pipeline question with urban uh, organization especially have seen there are generally two uh, two categories of sources right so one is the as we call it the b2c and the b2b2c b2c is where you directly get volunteers to sign up for you for example through social media through pamphlet distribution through f telephonic uh, uh, calls and stuff like that uh, outreach that you're doing directly to the thing and the other is b2b2c which is what Vibha and Prem was sharing like partnering with NGOs partnering with colleges, partner with corporates. So those are the broad two categories that I have personally seen uh, in that. That might not be relevant. Again, I see a rural question there. Um, so one thing I think we have assumed, we could be wrong, is that there is the general tightness in a community, the stickiness in the community in a rural area. Uh, so it's people have that sense of uh, closeness and they help each other anyway, right? Uh, in terms of, um, yeah, again, I think I would use see similar principles in rural areas. Vibha Prem, you can add if you have uh, worked there. But I think um, just getting volunteers to help um, do something, again, quickly. And then sort of that's an approach I'll follow there as well. Specifically, I'm not too sure because we haven't personally worked too much in the rural spaces. Uh, but yeah, that's my take.
I'll also share very quickly about uh, the rural era because in our program in Future of Impact, we do have uh, uh, organizations that work exclusively in rural areas. And um, of course, it's a it's a whole different challenge, uh, but there are similar ways, right? There are colleges uh, in rural areas as well, College of Social Work, which you can tie up with. It's better to go that way uh, because sometimes also people don't know. Um, and of course, I think a lot more depends on how embedded uh, the organization or the founder is in the community itself. And I think the core of it all is what is the work that's being offered, right? And is it meaningful um, for them to join? Um, so so, so that is what I, I can also add in from our experience. Um, I can see that Vikas has had his hand raised for a while. Uh, Vikas ji, would you like to ask a question now or in the chat box? Yeah, Vishali, thank you so much. So uh, my question is to Prem. Uh, Prem, your, uh, uh, the model is very good. Uh, I think it's a very interesting okay. model. So I need to understand the success rate of that model. Let me give you a more brief, uh, understanding about that. So assuming that you must be having some set targets, right? right. So yeah. how much you know target have you achieved or this model has helped you to achieve? Because that's a very interesting point to mm -hmm. understand whether this, uh, you know, uh, going through the Sathis have really helped to achieve? Right. Uh, so uh, I'll just quickly give you the brief Over numbers. The that we... as well. Sorry, sorry, I lost your voice. Sir, we, your voice is breaking. Yeah. But, I, but I got your question. Uh, but I got your question. Uh, so I'll quickly give you the brief numbers that we did last year. So around last year, we resolved around 13,000 uh, some cases with the help of 800 plus volunteers in the field. And each volunteer uh, has resolved around... Um, so we had a criteria set, which was if they solve three cases in the field, we issue a certificate to them. But most of them did more than three cases. Most of them did around five, six, seven, eight cases. So uh, yeah, it, it really worked well for us in that case. Uh, each volunteer, some, some volunteer was helping a woman a widowed woman apply for a pension. Some was helping a, a person with eye cataract uh, to get eye cataract operation done, staying with them throughout the process. Some volunteer was helping a disabled person acquire a disability certificate throughout, uh, in, in the hospital. It's a very difficult process, believe me. But volunteers, once they get into it, once they take up that case, they feel that it's their case. They take ownership and responsibility of the case. So we also, we also at the same time, trust the volunteer uh, that they will complete the case. We show that trust on them, that they will take care of the beneficiary. We tell them that these people have been exploited for a long time. It's time for all of us to be a part of it and to take charge. So they do take that responsibility and ownership. And for some reason, let's say, if even if a volunteer uh, wants to leave the case in the middle for some personal emergency, we do have a, another volunteer in place who can take up um, that case and continue from there. So these volunteers have taken multiple roles uh, in the last year from helping them applying pension, from going assisting them reaching to the hospitals, from reaching out to the uh, NGOs related to domestic violence. And yeah. So yeah, it has worked well for us. And for the next year, if we tell you, we have our targets at, uh, for around 40,000 cases. And we have already signed a partnership with an NGO for around 10,000 cases. So this, this structure that you mentioned that, yeah, so we are already receiving that amount of cases and solutions in place also. So yeah, I hope it answered your question. If not, please feel free to, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, pretty. I pray. Can I continue? In continuation to sure. the question, Vikas question. So yeah. So you assigned a task uh, to the volunteer case, but is there any capacity building will happen? Like if they want to do a certain thing, they should have some capacity, capacity in the sense, the awareness of how doing it, how to do it, why to do it, what to do it. Will you provide any capacity building or yeah, on, yeah, their yeah. Day, on their own, they will try to learn the things? And... No, 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 no. We, we do provide, we have pre-reads ready. We have how to go about it. If someone wants to apply for a disability certificate, we already have pre-reads in place. Uh, and there is always the volunteer manager or the volunteer leaders 
or we also have a buddy system. The old volunteers who have solved those cases, we connect the new volunteer with the old volunteer and that's how they, they come in contact and they guide each other in resolving that case. But we always have pre-reads in place, what to do, how to go about it. There's, that's always, our SOPs are always in place. So, so what amount of time commitment will you ask at the beginning of the beginning of their yeah. enrollment? So we ask them to solve three cases. Once you solve three cases, you get a certificate, but we like to keep it flexible. That's our organization culture. Volunteering means a flexibility. Is It means when, whenever you can volunteer, but I've often seen that a lot of volunteering organizations have been going, uh, have been asking to commit, have been asking for the commitment, have been asking for time frame. But at organization, we like to keep it flexible. We like to keep it free and free. They're free to come and do as they will. So yeah. Uh, sorry, if I, if, I, if I permit, I'll continue that one more question because I'm also a running a volunteer organization since 15 years. That flexibility will sometimes lead to lack of accountability and commitment. Right? Uh, will that become a culture in the organization or how you handle it and how you manage it and what type of uh, like uh, while coming as a volunteer do you do you, do you have any procedures or structures where or just a oral information will be trans transmitted regarding their uh, commitment and what you are expecting from them so we do expect them to solve at least three cases once they register in a, at a briefing also we tell them that please we request you to be available when the case comes and uh, we can only request that's the point we can only request at the end of the day we cannot force them or we cannot tell them that why were you not there for the beneficiary at the end of the day so we we always request we place it in a manner that they also feel responsible about it right so we do have a <laughs> Uh, we do try to generate that responsibility and ownership through our uh, words, through our culture within the organization, through our identity of a Sathi. So our Sathi identity, it's it's very crucial. A Sathi means a friend who will be there for you. And there have been multiple Sathis within the organization. So through all these narratives that we are trying to build within the organization, we try to create responsibility and ownership. But no, we don't do that. You have to commit this. You have to be there. We don't force them. We just tell them that these people have been exploited for a long time and you you should be there for them. That's the culture we are trying. And so far it's been working. But the moment it doesn't work, we'll try to bring some stringent rules and actions into place. So, yeah. I think the key here is what both of you have mentioned, right? Structure with flexibility. I think that's yeah. really key to volunteering and of course, trusting and orienting them and offering the support system. Well. There are three questions uh, that are here uh, and, and they're all important. They're very much part of our uh, structure as well. So I'll take them up one by one. One is related to, uh, you know, monitoring, right? And how do you monitor uh, volunteers working in the field? And I think you both have mentioned some ways, but uh, Ashik, feel free to add if you have seen other unique ways in which people uh, do monitoring and also uh, what kind of impact metrics are being used uh, mm. for volunteering. Uh, very to measure. Like, yeah, I can yeah. very quickly like, can add. For us, I think the, the scale is more important. I would not say more important, but scale is what we measure more than the... Uh, the uh, the outcomes that these volunteers are because we work with different kinds of organizations, right? Like in Prem's case, the outcome is very different. Whereas in Vibha's case, the outcome is very different. Um, however, as I mentioned in the slides also, volunteering hours, volunteering numbers, um, the meaning of the volunteer. So like, can you have feedback forms for the volunteers who can share how their experience was and design the program around that? And then the outcomes of, from the beneficiary side, right? Are the cases for example, being solved actually at Sampark Sati. And if it is being solved, what is the amount of value that they are creating in the uh, Sampark Sati's, in the beneficiary's life? Uh, in Vibha's case, for example, like um, are the ITI, RTIs being solved, for example? Are the awareness sessions actually being useful? And are the beneficiaries actually taking action post that? So those are some outcomes that would be. So that will be case by case. Uh, I would say outcome measurement in terms of volunteering management. I think most of us still at the early stages use a combination of Google form, Google sheets, pen and paper. 
but there are a lot of these volunteering management systems in place uh, you can uh, check out uh, honestly if you're good with technology you can uh, build something on your own but you can talk to a lot of these uh, organizations like a platform commons or like a erp next or even get like a tech, tech volunteer to build something but i think at my assumption is most of us in this call are at very early stages i think pen and paper or a combination of google form and excel sheet I think is just best and lean. And then you can reach out to, once you have some budget, you can reach out to folks who can build it for you uh, versus spending too much time building something before even nailing down the volunteering model, right? So that's just my two cents. Uh, Vibha, Prem, if you have to add something. No, I'm, I'm absolutely with you on that. We still use just Excel sheets and Google Forms to sort of collate our data and it works really well for us. I think just figuring out those Excel tools that help you out is, is definitely something that's um, that's that's useful, I think. So doing like a quick brush up on uh, Excel tools was very helpful for us. Um, I can actually take the next question on how to approach colleges for collaborations and structure around their um, academic schedule. This is a great question um, because frequently the concern that comes up with colleges and college students is, you know, you have exams, you have submissions, um, your classes, where do you really find the time to do this sort of work? Um, so the way that we've structured our program, and, and I'll tell you our experience, is that we leave the timelines up to them. So the benefit of having a three-month period, so essentially we give them a task list that has 10 tasks with tasks, like I mentioned, like legal awareness workshops, door-to-door -door campaigns, RTIs. Um, the goal is that in those, 10, in those three months, they finish those 10 tasks. What they choose to do when is entirely up to them, which is great because, for example, there are some weeks in your semester or trimester um, that are set aside for your exams. You have to sit and prepare for them. Um, the flexibility that this gives the students is choosing when they do the actions that they want to engage in. So this allows them a broad time frame that they know they have to finish these tasks within, but internally they can select when they want to do what they want to do. This model, I think, is easier because, for example, we're not necessarily constrained. Like I was reading in one of the questions, um, there's a, I think, education-based um, initiative that's looking for volunteers to have class timings for students and then the college timings don't work out then. That's a restriction that we're able to avoid because of this. So, for example, if and the thing is, each batch in a university and each university has its own unique timetable. It's impossible to create a volunteering schedule that works for every single university and forget every single university for every single batch in a university only you can't create a schedule like that. So my suggestion was is to be able to build around that. Um, for example, we've had volunteers who've had like half day in colleges where they take off and they'll go to a government school and conduct their program there. There was almost little to no way we could have known what their schedule specifically looks like. But giving them this level of flexibility allows them to plan according to their timetables. That's worked really well for us. Um, the second thing, I think, having, um, I think, goals that are smaller in nature um, and more regular also are very helpful. Because when you say three months, it's very easy to lose your momentum as a volunteer. So, for example, some of our smaller tasks include updating a work tracker, for example, that says, I've done this work, or uploading some photos onto your drive, things like that. So, making sure they're continuously engaged is something that's very, very important. You are always going to, at least in my experience, have volunteers who are going to find it difficult because of their schedule, um, and that's okay. It's, it's, it's just the way that I think in our experience it's been, and that's completely fine about how we collaborate with the colleges themselves. Um, we've found actually recently that one thing works really well, which is once you work directly with the students, they become, as Oishik was saying, advocates for your cause. So for example, a university that we're working with in Bombay, we ended up directly working with the students and these students went to the university and said, we want this to be a formal collaboration. Um, so my take on this is, working directly with an institution whether it's a school or college or another like organization is incredibly important but build it up for yourself you don't have to set the goal as i need to work with x number of colleges directly i think if you're able to build a culture within that college 
where internally students want this to be a formalized activity that's a lot more powerful than just going to the college and saying you have to force your students to work with us um when you create that sort of internal motivation for students to want their colleges or want their schools to sign up it's a lot more sustainable because you know there's a demand for that work in the college if you sign up with a college where no one is interested that partnership with the college or school is really of no value so building that relationship with the students of the institution um is i think something that's really crucial um that was my i think two cents on working with universities great thank you thank you so much viva uh, there are some amazing questions in the chat box so we're just going to focus on that if that's okay with everyone um so we have of course we i think more or less covered the technology bit uh, i think there are some and we'll also link after the webinar we'll send you a small uh, list of resources that you can use um, but of course i think technology always it's better to ask why before investing um there are questions regarding um how do you tap into an oichik when you began you said spoke about retired professionals and housewives right um are you aware of any uh, any angel that has successfully tapped into that network uh, or how does one do that because that's one question in the chat box yeah uh, i just responded so evidya loka is one example uh, they do that really well and they're based in bangalore and they get um homemakers working professionals to teach children in rural areas uh, in a classroom format um right virtually so they can teach from people actually from like us also teach in like rural parts of west bengal or rural parts of karnataka etc um have to get creative i think some examples just i wrote down like try to get into whatsapp groups of homemakers if you can give them a taste of what um the work may look like before just pitching join us as a volunteer um then think about yeah i think think about even residential groups right if you have most of the residences or neighborhoods would have a whatsapp group where there will be all the homemakers um who are taking decisions and stuff like that can you sort of get into that or find someone who is like an influence influ influential person in that group can you tap into those groups you could even go creative and think think like morning walk me ja ke pamphlet dena and all of that right those are yeah. things that actually also work right uh, you can reach out to people directly put up a stall somewhere where you see that um, homemakers visit a lot right like there is if there is a uh, grocery shop around and you want to put a stall there so i mean creative things like those you don't need to exactly do that but i think creatively if people can get a like know who you are and then get a sense of what the work that you do So there is no one fixed answer, but try to identify who the influential person is, and then give them a taste so that they can start talking about it. So those are things I've seen work uh, well for some organizations. And then I think once you tap into that, it it will be easy when people start talking about the work and you're creating meaningful value. So, yeah. Great. If anyone wants to add. Okay. There's another question on um, uh, aligning volunteers' goals need uh, to the organization's impact and goal, and what does measuring the volunteer experience look like? Um, hmm. If any of you would like to answer that, hmm. so I think just quickly adding to this, I think it's important to first uh, figure out what your goal is, and do you see that volunteers can even play a role in actually solving for what you're trying to solve? Right? Don't force fit it. um that sometimes becomes a challenge then you are probably just focusing on uh something that may not solve for the larger goal so once you figure that out and then you if you know that okay volunteering can help solve um can you design programs around that is what i would say um yeah in terms of measurement i think simple tools like the nps score like the net promoter score if they are actually going to talk about your work to others um uh, just conversations with them to understand if uh, what is working what is not i think conversations work very well simple feedback forms ratings um, combination of all these i think work well for feedback prem vibha if you'd like to add anything to that Prem, go ahead. Could you please come again with the question? I was reading okay. the other questions actually. 
No, sure. If there's another question that you'd like to answer, please go ahead. But just asking if uh, there's another way in which you uh, measure volunteer experience at Sampak Sati or that you've seen so, otherwise, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we do take uh, feedbacks. Uh, we have feedbacks from uh, normal Google Forms, and that's how we uh, measure their experience. And also, uh, like we mentioned, that uh, if they, like we have a criteria of three cases and we issue a certificate, if this falls more than uh, four, five, and six, so that's also uh, sort of a measurement criteria. If this falls more cases, right? Be they go beyond their certificate limit and they're just not leaving. And if they leave in one case, we definitely ask what went wrong, yeah. right? If what went wrong. So that's very important for us, that feedback. Uh, when a, a person solves one case and they leave. So yeah, we, we have uh, measurements like that. Feedback form is a good source of. And of course, volunteer leader is in touch with the volunteers regularly. So we keep getting uh, uh, reviews and feedback from there. Uh, so uh, I want to uh, this question that we work with underprivileged children and need volunteers to teach English in, offline yeah. and online. So uh, we also face this problem because a lot of uh, hospitals and NGOs work at the morning time. So we also uh, started uh, recruiting volunteers from IGNU, SOL, and then we also have evening colleges. I'm talking mm -hmm. about this in Delhi. So yeah. It's uh, it's working out well for us when we started work uh, started recruiting volunteers from evening colleges as well as IGNU as well. They these people are these uh, call uh, students from these uh, colleges and are very enthusiastic and they are very much into internships and volunteering. So yeah, that's what we have observed. I would also encourage yeah. everyone. Thank you, thank you, Prem. Uh, also, uh, thank you to all the speakers because we're also trying to answer a lot of the questions in the chat box. So would encourage everyone else also to look at it if it's going okay for you. Um, there is a question on uh, scale. And there's another question that I also had about sustainability, right? Um, and I can see that Vikas has added another question for you, Prem, which is about the, uh, you know, having full-time full-time employees versus volunteers versus the cost comparison. So um, uh, again, I'd, I'd like to open it up to uh, all of you in terms of um, how can we uh, achieve scale, right? Um, and also, is there a way in which, uh, you know, is this truly sustainable? Like, can you run your entire organization just on volunteers? Is that a possibility? Uh, short answer is yes. Sorry, Viva, you were answering that. Go ahead. Uh, short answer is yes. There are larger organizations like the Robin Hood Army, for example. They call themselves a zero cost model, right? So all of it is run by volunteers. There are organizations like Make a Difference. Um, all of the uh, fellows, uh, volunteers, city heads, they have hardly X number of uh, employees. I don't know the exact number right now, but most of them uh, are volunteers. So definitely possible. Um, that's the short answer, but I think at the early stage, it's very important to fix the program and sort of design a program which is scalable. Nato, it'll be very hard to write. At Evolve also, what we try to do is that set these uh, audacious sort of goals. And Viva and I were talking about it right before the call as well, where there is sometimes challenging that balancing between scale and the quality, etc. But our belief at Evolve is that once you design for scale is when you will be able to scale. So I think it's very important to sort of design the program accordingly. A lot of the larger organizations, which we also realized, didn't design for scale. Uh, and a few years down the line, they face certain challenges, which could have been solved a few years back, right? Uh, five years back. So that's what we are trying to do with our entrepreneurs, at least at uh, Evolve, and get them to scale early on so that they can fix aspects of the program, which are scalable. Uh, yeah. But to answer your question, yes, it can be done. Vibha Prem. Thanks, Ashik. Yeah, we were literally half an hour before this call talking about scale. Um, I think for me, my perspective comes from a very young organization that's now working with volunteers and, and looking at scaling. So uh, while you're listening, I think that's the lens that you should be listening to this from. There are definitely challenges that come with it. Um, I think you think, especially because we are a small full-time team that, that works uh, at Outlawed right now. 
Um, but there are a lot of benefits that accrue from it once you have a good program design in place. And I think that's maybe what we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, for example, the um, campus ambassador program, this active citizen challenge that we run in universities across the uh, country. And I think we're um, in about 10 cities right now. The reason that it works with um, not too much of a time or money expenditure from our side is because we've created a process for most things. Um, and a lot of things are yet to be figured out, but at least in the initial stages, um, I'll give you an example. Once students are onboarded, we've created individual um, Google Drive links for each volunteer head who works with us. Um, and within this Drive link, we have resources for them. So the 10 task lists that we've given them for each and every single item on the checklist, we have a resource that's assigned to it that will either help them learn about it, that will give them resources to actually conduct the task or have like helpful FAQs and like um, explain the process to actually finish that task. For example, on RTIs, we've created material on exactly how you file an RTI. For the pamphlets, and this is something we've actually gotten feedback about, so I'll tell you about this, we created pamphlets that can be distributed in a door-to-door -door campaign. Um, and the feedback that we got from the volunteers don't spoon feed us so much. So, you know, you go in with quite a few assumptions that are busted um, during this creation of processes. Um, but having a solid process in place means that we have our weekly check-in with our volunteer groups. And having groups of volunteers who work together as opposed to just standalone volunteers has been really helpful for us, I think, in terms of just tracking the work that they've been doing and also typically with students getting to work with other students is also a big motivating factor so having that team in place is something that works well for us so on that google drive link we have all the material that they need to actually use this um, in case they have any faqs we have an faq sheet all of that in place we do have regular trainings as well um, and that's probably something we'll discuss later but just ensuring that the volunteers themselves know and have the skills to engage the communities that they're working with so I think having processes that are simple enough for volunteers to grasp by themselves um, that allows them to do a large chunk of work themselves is a big part of scale for us. For example, I'll give you another example. Um, we took a risk by stepping away from execution. Um, what I mean is that volunteers have to get a lot of permission to do the work they do. You can't just walk into a government school or walk into a legal awareness workshop we deliberately sort of moved ourselves away from taking part in those processes um, and we said can we do two things by doing this first it reduces the need for us to be involved in these operational steps of volunteers but second it of course builds this culture among volunteers to do it themselves so now our law schools can reach out to whatever communities they want to reach out to by themselves without us having to be involved. And for that, the scale, I think, is higher there, as opposed to if we had to work with every single law school to get permission in the government school they want to go to, in the Anganwadi center they want to go to. That would have, I think, in my opinion, made it a lot slower for us. So I think handing over ownership of the program completely to volunteers is such a big part of scale. And, you know, like leaving that sort of um, tendency that you have as an organization to want to control every part of your project and saying the volunteers are going to handle this, I think is one part to unlocking scale. At least for us, that's worked well for us. So just really stepping away from the execution, but of course, having good systems in place that allow you to do that. We're facing challenges with this, of course, um, and it's something that we need to overcome with better processes, as Oshik was saying. Um, but allowing volunteers to do this by themselves is something that's been really good for us. Hey, thank you. Um, I think a lot of questions are being answered on chat as well, which is great. Um, but just just a, a time check, and I think a lot of questions have come about for corporate professionals. Um, I think one of the main challenges that we've also seen many NGOs struggle with is getting in to a corporate uh, engagement program. You know, like who do you reach out to? Because usually the CSR person is not so accessible always for people. Um, so are there um, uh, are there any suggestions or any platforms uh, or, you know, if if anyone would like to facilitate, facilitate connections with each other? Um, 
and I think I, I'm also opening this up to the audience to answer actually because I'm sure a lot of NGOs have a lot of different experiences with corporate so uh, it would be great to hear uh, suggestions and resources from the audience as well. Oh, should I share? Yeah, please. Uh, so I think before partnerships, my take is that reach out to individuals who are in corporates. Mm -hmm. If they can speak for your org, it's better than you reaching out as a cold connect, right? Because there is this amount of trust with the corporates already because they are their employees versus you reaching out directly. I think till the time you are a brand and people know you, it's, for example, it's easier for a, Maybe let's say a make a difference, a teach for India, etc. Child rights and you to reach out to corporates directly. That's one way. So engage corporates who you want to eventually tap into, create meaningful value and then ask them to maybe advocate for you. Number two is that you can go for these intermediaries. There are a lot of them right now, like a good era. I think I volunteer also does something like um, that as well. So they often have into uh, corporate connects. So you can reach out to them and uh, that's uh, maybe a good starting point too. But I would always prefer the first because you actually get to um, get to see if there are sort of corporates who are actually finding value and can they get in a couple others from their uh, friend, friend list who are also in the corporate. Um, and that really works well. I have seen with a lot of organizations. Yeah. Great. Um, Ashish, you I'll just ask if anyone else from the audience would like to share anything or ask anything. Uh, otherwise, I will request each of you to share your final thoughts on anyone who is uh, either building a new program with volunteers or uh, Hello? wants to improve this. Yes. Hi. Uh, I have one question. Please go ahead. Uh, so, like, for example, uh, I, the question is like you... Uh, how to retain volunteers? For example, if my volunteer is working for one month, and I know that uh, there are gaps after fifteen twenty gaps. And Prasad, your voice is breaking. I retain my uh, Prasad. Hello? Prasad, your voice is breaking. Hello. 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 We can hear you now, but your voice is breaking. Hello, you can hear me now? Yes, Hello? yes. Yes. So my question is like how to retain our volunteers. Like for example, uh wo one month kile kam karne aa rahe mere saath. Wo one month kile kam kar rahe. But after uh, 10 20 days mujhe mujhe pata hai ki like there is one month ka gap. Abhi kuch kaam nahi hai. So and I have to involve them again in my uh, in next month fir se ek mahine ke gap gap ke baad. So how how we can uh, retain them? What are the strategy? We can use to retain them. How we can stop them? Ki baba, wo unka interest fir se usme leke aaye. Taaki ham logo ko dikkat na ho fir se wo month mein dhoonne ki liye volunteers. So this is my question. So how we can uh, solve this? Vaishali, would you mind maybe summarizing the question? I sure, sure. I will do that. I will do that. So I think and uh, Prasad, मुझे बताना अगर ठीक से समझे कि नहीं what he's asking is also uh, you know somebody signed up for one month um, one is also how you retain them and also maybe if there is no work in the middle but you need them later on um, are there ways to manage that or have any strategies work for you Prasad say Samji yes 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 yeah um, I can maybe add to this um, a little bit I think a few things. It's not necessary that volunteers always have to have work for sure. Um, mm -hmm. If you sign up, say, in November and you had only two, three tasks for the month of November, but in December you realize there's so much work that this volunteer could be doing. That's that's completely normal and I think that happens reasonably frequently. I think with retention there are a few different things that come into play. The first is how is the volunteer's experience those three times they actually volunteer? If you are able to get the volunteer to stick with those three volunteer experiences that they've had, getting them to continue on by saying these are the kind of experiences you get to do in the next few coming months or next few experiences should not be too hard. 
But apart from that, I think two other things can really help keeping them in the circle. The first, and this is something we're trying to do more of and we're learning how to do this, is creating a community within your volunteers where volunteers are able to engage with each other. So even, for example, that if there isn't a task going on, they still have a community like a WhatsApp group or something that's still active. People are posting about it. People are sending photos from their work experiences where volunteers know what's currently in the loop. And we're working on this as well. We haven't nailed it. So it does take time. Um, the third way that I think that you can also sort of continue to um, engage these volunteers if they're not working is learning experiences for volunteers. Um, mm. Frequently at Outlawed, we have, for example, we recently had a workshop which was on which um, an ex Teach for India program um, manager actually conducted where we had them talk about good teaching practices because a lot of our volunteers are actually engaged in teaching in government schools, to adult populations, in communities, all of this. So having these learning experiences, in my opinion, helps volunteers stay engaged. It's a great way to skill build for volunteers, but also a great way to continue let the like connected to the organization, which hopefully gets them excited for what's to come in the coming month. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think planning your tasks ahead of time is obviously like crucial, but sometimes it doesn't work out. But some of these things in our experience have helped a little bit. I think in our experience also similarly, we just prefer to ask them, uh, you know, how their next few months are looking and just genuinely having an honest conversation and putting that down, right? And once you accommodate your volunteers' needs as well, I think it works uh, it, it works really well. Um, great. Um, we I have Parulji. Parulji's hand is up. So we'll take that question as maybe our last question since we have about eight minutes to close. Uh, but uh, the audience has been fantastic. Thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, Arulji, please go ahead. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, so uh, my experience of it is question come sharing of experiences. So uh, you have quite a few uh, volunteers, uh, both local as well as international. Uh, International usually come for longer time, whereas uh, local student volunteers are for shorter time. Uh, the uh, our experience has been that you know you volunteers can be add on to some of your programs at times, but uh, if you you cannot plan programs depending on volunteers. That is that is very important that. You cannot 100% that this is going to happen like that. Unless it is like one day, some events. So event to event, it is okay. But ongoing, you are running some ongoing program. Uh, you That is uh, difficult to plan based on the volunteer strength. Uh, getting, my question is also like, you know, getting uh, for some work at the grassroots level, yes. But getting for some organization work, you know, maybe translation or some some more senior like communication or those kind of work, it is difficult to find uh, volunteers who are qualified and who can do those work and then they do it with sustainability. So that is one challenge. For I mean, uh, I've had quite a few volunteers from Tata Pro Engage. And few are really very good, but not many. So if uh, any one of you have experience of those time, it would be really great to either having like a volunteer for a long time or a sustainable basis. That is one. And second is like, you know, having some qualified volunteer for a more uh, this kind of work. Uh, so if you have any experiences to share, will be great. Thank you. I do think sometimes the model itself uh, depends completely on volunteers and it does work. It's very risky. I agree. Uh, but it does work. And I think uh, Evolve has some successful examples of that, right, Rishi? Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, Parul, there are organizations. It depends a little bit on your solution and how you are designing the program. Um, but 
short answer definitely there are organizations who run solely with volunteers um the, you have to solve for things like when a new volunteer is coming in how do you induct them train them get up to speed and then get them to do smaller things like org related stuff or shorter programs once they retain and deliver quality outcomes is when you get them like more uh, more important i don't want to say but more um, like longer term tasks but definitely i think to answer your question there are organizations and it's possible you should go through the evolve website there are some examples which are volunteering led um maybe we can even connect to you with some of them who you can directly talk with if you want that would be awesome thank you Aungshu. thank you if we have roshni whose hand is up and also uh, i think there was a volunteering platform that megha had mentioned Correct. have you yeah so roshni that? yeah before that question just a quick plug um uh, at India Welfare Trust, we created for all these kind of questions only, right? A lot of organizations are uh, just starting off their volunteering work. So we have a platform that we have created. I'll just paste it here. Uh, Megha, can you paste the link if you're here? Okay, Megha. He talking. had already pasted it and, and I'll make sure that all of these links that we're talking about is sent out in an email as a post read so got it, got it. so yeah basically this is this discourse platform that uh, megha was talking about where there are a lot of these larger organizations um, early stage organizations and even staff members of organizations who are in the volunteering space or trying to get into the volunteering space so would recommend uh, getting added to that or joining that a lot of resources are often shared also uh, from these uh, 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 experts expert leaders and some questions are also answered so maybe useful to join. I'll paste the link uh, in a bit. Eshwarya has pasted the link. It's called everyindianvolunteering.it. So Perfect. please do look at that. Yeah. Um, great. Roshni, we'll take your question as the last one. Um, yeah. yeah. I'll be very quick and it's sort of like a comment and maybe like a lead into the future. And I also want to refer for what Parul said. I think uh, very useful. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think Maybe where Parul is coming from is, you know, organizations who are 30, 40 years old, who have, you know, had a history of the kind of work we do and we've engaged with, of course, volunteers. Uh, the approach that you're all bringing, what I'm hearing is really like, I really like how you kept talking about a program designed for volunteering. So for us, volunteers are always like an add-on. We have, you know, there are three people to do 20 tasks. Let me just get some volunteers. But I think what you're all talking about is a little different. So I think that's the biggest takeaway for those of us who are, you know, older organizations who are used to having volunteers is come help me do my work, like creating specific volunteer programs. And then I go back to what Oishik said earlier about investing the time and energy for that. So that was like a big takeaway for me, I think. And perhaps what would be really useful moving ahead is to focus on like maybe a smaller, like a round table or something where we have these sorts of organizations who have had volunteering, you know, highs and lows and try to understand how we can start. So we are not completely volunteer led, you know, how we can start to, within the work that we already do, set aside some percentage of our time, energy resources to start designing these volunteer only programs. Uh, it would be great to have some kind of like a learnings from all of you who are very much volunteer only focused and you know, the whole vision is related to volunteering to sort of have a cross exchange with, for those of us who want to add it on as a layer, but are doing it differently than how you're approaching it. I think there's a lot more to unpack in that space. And it'd be great if, you know, Atma could design something like that. And uh, I would be happy to be part of that. Many of us would, I think. So yeah, thanks. That's all for me. Roshni, thank you so much. You you actually concluded session very well <laughs> for us. Um, uh, absolutely right. I think there were very, uh, very nice, insightful things uh, from today's conversation. And of course, the biggest thing is to take volunteering as... Uh, uh, as a program in itself, it really works. We've seen it at Atma as well. Uh, we shifted from in-person to online and we're still doing well with volunteering. So there is a lot to do here. Um, thank you to everyone for uh, joining today and for asking all the questions. And we will be sending out uh, a recording of this webinar today along with all the amazing links and resources shared. Um, in an email and yes please do keep coming back for this and uh, i think do check out that 
the the discourse website uh, i think we can continue a lot of conversations there and yes thank you so much and have a great week uh, and once again thank you so much uh, oishik vibhan prem for taking out time and for the work that you do uh, it's truly inspiring so thank you thank you vishali thanks vibha thanks, thanks prem thanks everyone thank you vishali bye bye thank you, thank you. Bye, Ashok. Bye, Ashok. Bye, Ashok.